We got a little special edition. I mean, not only are we eating in front of you guys, one of our favorite places where all our crew and, and friends and tackle guys all go to the Santee Miley's over in Torrance. Uh, but I have my brother who uh, basically saved our butts all these years. And he's, uh, you know, he went up and took the Cherokee Geisha, which was the Chubasco, and it was in Mothballs up in Brisbane. And he and Brian Kerhar, you had all the boys, boy, the heart was hard. Worked on it, yeah. All those guys were all on the boat, Harlan Burke. And, and um, anyway, they brought it back. Completely gutted it and refurbished it, and uh, but you know Steve's time on the water is I don't know it is I think he's probably three or four times more time on the water than I have. So as you talk about experience, he's got a heck of a lot more experience than I do. But I've depended on my brother for for every you know all that, and then uh, the best part is now as we're getting older, we're going to get to go just go fish, start fishing more together, yeah, and right. just fish. For us, we're not. Hooking, handing, we're not gaffing, we're not doing it, we're going to fish ourselves, so that's going to be a blast. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's going to be a family night. Uh, we brought in, you know, my sister and Steve brought in food, so uh, Phil and all of us have been <clears throat> chowing away, so you'll have to forgive us if we if you see stuff on it all over our face, you know. Uh, we loved it, it. I mean, it's good. And we're, we, we may even pick at it as we're talking, who knows. But it's all about family, and... And, uh, you know, I can't thank, my, and I've never done this, I haven't thanked my brother for all the stuff that he's done for us, but without him, we couldn't have survived. I mean, he... Well, all and, the all yeah. the crew members and licenses that we've had over the years, you guys all work for the love of fishing, not necessarily the money. That's that's the biggest part. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we had Brian Kirohara. Harlan Burke, you look at all the the kids. Yeah, yeah we all had you know, a lot of guys. The Tanaka yeah. brothers, you know, uh, Mike Redlew. I mean, there's so many involved in our operation. It, it really was a family, of people, and and that I think that's what made it so beautiful. You know, I mean, you look at uh, like say Mike Redlew ran ran the boat, the Mustang Formula One, but his dad Frank, invaluable. If it weren't for guys like Frank Redlew, Harold Wetter, who did all the oh, Detroit Phoenix. diesel work on our, you know, the, the V12s, the 871s, the 892s, his, you know, three V12s, all the generators. Well, when I went know. to diesel repair class, the teacher asked me why I was there because I had the best mechanic on the West Coast. The, uh, <laughs> oh, <that's, laughs> but he didn't go fishing with me every day. Yeah, yeah, but we were blessed, you know, and, and everybody knew Harold down here at 22nd Street too. I mean, between the Hesses, and George Mayo and all the rest of the guys down here, they helped, uh, you know, they helped do it on now. That barking you hear in the background, that's part of the show, folks. That'll come in in a little while. But as, as it stands here, it's a family deal. We got uh, my brother and then my, my sister, who at one time, uh, when we had the three boats down at H&M and at um, Highlandia, she would do the shopping for all of us. And uh, I didn't realize until... Uh, at, in the fall when she went back to college. I would do it, and we found out, boy, that sounds pretty vicious out there. <laughs> Guys in the corner fighting for the, the yeah. So anyway, um, uh, I lost myself. <laughs> Thanks, dogs. <laughs> Just the amount of work it takes to yeah. keep a boat running. Yeah, and, and the amount of friends and and. You know, people we call family now that all helped us over the years survive. And so, you know, and I, I never really officially thanked my brother, but, I mean, he was really the biggest part of it. I mean, he and, who was it, you and Junior? Who else went to the Detroit Diesel Schools? No, well, that was that, but, you yeah. know, Marty and yeah. Mike. Everybody yeah, we had the Tanaka got brothers. Got the licenses. Yeah. yeah, we had so many guys that went off and, and on their own and did very well with their own boats, too, so... You know, very blessed by that, and so like it's a it's a tribute to you know all the the times, the great times. But we're going to segue into later. Is we had uh, at one time a dog that we found. Uh, the, our my last day in San Diego, we were down at Landia, so I took the crew down to Mission Bay, and we're eating at one of the 
you know, the, the restaurants alongside the street there, and we're outdoors. And one of my crew members is bending over. I go, what are you doing, Mark? He goes, well, this is a little dog. So he picks it up, and it's a little, it was a, I knew, because our family had Yorkies and Silkies, this was Ludwig. I think he's is he standing on the Cherokee yeah. Geisha. Yeah. yeah. And so anyway, um, great story. Anyway, we're, we're sitting there on our last day, and we're getting ready to uh, go back up to bring the boat back up here to 22nd Street. And uh, so he's, he had a collar but no tag. And so I'm, I pick him up and I'm walking down Mission Boulevard. I'm looking around. Does anybody lose a dog, you know? But uh, it had no license or any, he had no license on it, just that blue collar. And so I said, well, okay, somebody's got to be looking for him. So I put him down, but he starts running out in Mission Boulevard. Well, I stop all the traffic. I run out and grab the dog. He says, okay, that's it. Talk to the, the waitresses at the restaurant there and says, listen, I'm going to give you my name, number, whatever. If somebody's looking for them, I'm going to be back in L.A. tomorrow because we're driving the boat up tonight, right? And so on the way back from the restaurant, I'm carrying Ludwig. Well, didn't even have the name yet, didn't but have a name. he became Ludwig later. And I'll tell you that story, too. That happened that night. But we were... Uh, I stopped, got some food for him and everything else, and uh, we're back on the back on the Mustang, getting ready to kick it for bring it back to L.A. And but we are all into Saturday Night Live. Well, John Belushi did a, uh, a spoof on Skip. Ludwig yeah. von Beethoven, right? And uh, Gilda Radner, I think, said, and 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 uh, later to be Wiggy he was very skinny, and. We're looking at it, and, you know, uh, Gilda Renner says to John Bellucci, Ludwig, you haven't eaten in days. And, you know, the name Ludwig stuck in my crew. We started calling him Ludwig because he probably hadn't eaten in days because he was so skinny. So we bring him on the boat. We cast off, put the, the loading ramp on, headed back to 22nd Street from San Diego. On the way, I call my folks. I says, hey, we got a guest coming in. We have, we're going to have a new visitor. So they come meet us here at 22nd Street. They get to see little Ludwig. Well, he has bleeding diarrhea. So we go, well, that's not good. So, you know, my folks said, yeah. yeah. Parvo. Yeah. Take him to the vet. So I take him to the vet. They do analysis. And he says, boy, he's got parvo virus. He might not make it, you know. And so I said, well, and maybe that's why the owner abandoned him. We don't know. But anyway... I took him to the vet and I said, do whatever you got to do to, to save him. And he went on IV. They saved him. And he, he, how many years did he live, Steve? He, he was in old. his teens. Yeah, 14 uh, or something uh, like that. Yeah. And so anyway, but this little dog, this guy here, okay, he was very scrawny. Um, it was funny, during the wintertime, he wouldn't get his feet wet. He wouldn't go outside to get his feet wet, right? So my sister buys him these little tiny rubber boots to put on. It was just, it was hilarious, right? But this dog that would not get his feet wet, we, t we were up in the Sierras, and he's walking alongside the stream with my dad at Mammoth Creek. My dad hooks a trout. He submerges his head, grabs the trout in his mouth, and starts peeling line on my dad on shore. He walks on shore and starts peeling line down. I have it on video. I'm going to have to bring it. We're going to dig around and try to find that. It's classic. It's unbelievable. But here's a dog that wouldn't get his feet wet, but he put his head down in 30-degree water, grabs a trout, and just went nuts, you know. And so uh, he later on became very well-known around H&M Landing. He, you know, and he had an incident down there where he fell off the boat. And I can remember, I think Dad said that the, he saw a huge sea lion boil. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was mortified, you know. Uh, and, uh, oh, my God. Turns out Ludwig was probably swam under a duck. Well, one of our reason. other captains down there scooped him out of the water. With <laughs> a bait scoop? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so anyway, he was, uh, he was quite the dog. But later on, we're going to show you. He was he was rescued, and um, uh, you know, 
This is a huge member of the family. My dad would take him on his motorcycle and took him into his jacket and all he'd see is his head as they're riding along. But tonight we have some, and we're gonna come in a little bit later uh, with my sister and they rescued two dogs. And brother they, and sister. A brother and sister, and they're just, you know, neat Huskies. Neat dogs. Huskies. But um, we're gonna show them and Anybody, we're looking for somebody to adopt them, right? Yeah, somebody to adopt is. them that's familiar with Huskies and their needs. Um, they're wonderful dogs, and they're going to be turning six in May this year. So they've gotten beyond a lot of the puppy habits, bad habits, and they're settling down. They're, they're wonderful dogs, but we have a hard time justifying four dogs at the house. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You want to read some comments? Real sure. Quick? Let's All let's right, go good. through. Let's go through some. All right. Yeah, uh, Angler Pliers. David Rosenthal says, "Good evening, guys. Rob hey, says, good is. evening, friends. Addicted to fishing. What's up, Phil? Happy early birthday. Thank you so much. Yeah, hey. Saturday's my B day. I appreciate it. He wants to know if the sand crabs have shown up in Surfside, and the answer is we've seen some patches of them, but uh, not all that much quite yet. We're kind of waiting a little bit longer." Um, also, cue ball, hard to beat the show. Prime time players, that's you two guys. Um, <laughs> Emmanuel Navego, good evening, guys. Hi from Florida. Danny, are your rods up for sale again? I believe you are having problems with the last manufacturer. What's yeah, no, no. We, we have, we have, we have the blanks. The blanks that are available, I have them at uh, with Brad Connell, one of my partners that is putting together handle kits for these things, the graphite handle kits. So just give us a call. Um, you know, let me give you, I'll give you my cell phone number. It's 310-283-7954. Call me and i give you the status on what we've got available for you. Okay? Give that one more time again, Dan. It's nice and slow. Area code 310-283-7954. Seven nine five four, and you can call me direct, and I'll I'll tell you what we've got available for you. Okay. All right, sounds good. Rob S. Danny, we had Labrador named Lady that caught more tilapia than us. She <laughs> dive and pull them up in the salt and sea. Good stuff, man. I got to tell you, Steve. Uh, we were talking about you made reference to all the things it takes to keep a boat running. Why don't you talk enumerate some of those things? What are they? Because People out there don't realize what a tough job this is. Well, first and foremost, you got to have your crew, captain, second captain, if you operate over 12 hours, and crew members. And then most of the boats now all have galleys, so you have to have a person in the galley that's willing to cook on a boat that's moving all the time. That's a special job in itself. But uh, once you get that secure, um, you got to have enough support on land to get your parts, groceries, supplies, um, and all the other <laughs> uh, paperwork that you need to get done just to get off the dock. Um, the boats nowadays have to deal with a, the alphabet soup of agencies to make sure they have all the proper licenses and, and passports and permits depending on where you're going, what you're fishing. And uh, you gotta have it all kept in order, otherwise you get aced out of a lot of, a lot of fishing areas. So um, the support and then the landings, they do their job to try to keep everybody in line and get them bookings and keep boats filled up. If fishing's good, uh, there's not enough boats, if fishing's tough, you gotta try to manufacture trips and get out. It's, it's a tough business, but uh, the amount of people that it takes is quite a few. Uh, all the way down to the guys that want to scrub the boat, all the way to the captains that want to drive, and the owners that just want to collect their money. <laughs> nah, they, they risk a lot. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. Yeah. It is a lot of work. And, you know, fortunately for all of us, uh, you know, most of us, it was, it's a, it was a passion for us. So, you know, yeah, the 20 hour days was, you just dealt with it. You just dealt with it. And I mean, and Steve could tell you, there are days, stretches. I mean, 
we worked 100 day stretches with no days off and you're talking 20 hour days so you know after you do that for a living for a while everything else in life seems pretty easy right. so now it's time you know I, he's paid his dues and we're talking we're going to start fishing together a little bit more and uh start reaping the other benefits of just enjoying it you know rather than you know doing all the you know the uh, the boat work the you know the stress part of the running the boats and everything else we just go out and go fish um, Rob S. says, I hear that you guys are having a hard time getting crew now. <coughs> Any truth to that? Yeah, I, I don't actually do the hiring. We have a whole list of people that would think about coming out. And a lot of times, you know, it's a probationary trip or two to see if the people could even hang with the, the schedule and the amount of hours and the amount of work that's needed. Um, but the guys that are on the boat, work their butts off and uh, hopefully they're getting rewarded enough to come back out and provide a service to all our fishermen. It's uh, like I said, it's a tough gig, but when the fishing's good, there's no place I'd rather be. <laughs> do you, do you think with the work <clears throat> ethic of younger people now has deteriorated, diminished that the work ethic isn't the same as it was? I think every generation says that the next generation is way lazier than we were, but are they lazy now? They don't last on the boat if they are. Yeah. So they get weeded out really fast. And uh, I tell you, the kids that we have on the boat, a lot of them are sharp. They, they really have their stuff together. They want to improve, move up the ladder, run the boats, learn more about the fishing industry. Um, so it's... It's uh, it's a flip of the coin whether or not you get a crew member that wants to make a, a living at it. I'm interested in what the Kadota brothers think about March bluefin, yellowfin. A lot of yellows biting up the, down the coast. What do you guys think? This is a crazy start to the year. I mean, as a passenger, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. As a, a guy that's got to run the boat... <laughs> Wow, wow, what a long what a season. What a long season. And also you know, the landing, too. I mean, yeah. if they can get going, get the ball rolling, uh, it takes a lot of pressure off a lot, a lot of the boats if they can start running early. Uh, yeah. Is, and it sounds good. Is the ball rolling? It's rolling. It seems like it, right? It's rolling. Yeah, I don't know yeah, about well, all the boats getting well, no, not hooked all of them, up. But yet, I mean, but, yeah. But the fish are certainly. I mean, they got right. that line of yellow to coming up and down below. Yeah, that's the blue fantastic fin. news. The bluefin, yeah. I mean. My God, what was it the snap uh, last? What was it last night, Phil? That they yeah uh, they Pacific Dawn I think had a dozen over a hundred. The Polaris Supreme had forty three bluefin, fifty to one hundred eighty pounds. Yeah, I saw some of the clips of that that you yeah. had out. Yeah, yeah right. Unbelievable, folks. Yeah. Look at your calendars, people. This is March. <laughs> Hey, Jonathan Joe wants to know, are you required to have someone on board that can handle medical emergencies, seeing that you have so many of us old folks on board sometimes? Great show tonight. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, basic first aid for the captains. Um, but, you know, nowadays we have access to the satellite phones, uh, instantly connecting with um, Coast Guard and... Uh, qualified uh, paramedic type people that work for that agency, they do a wonderful job. And if it's an emergency, we've had a few airlifts where they come out with the helicopter and get the passengers off. Um, and they're the best in the world. Yeah, that I, I, I encountered that the one time and I was lucky. It was just at the Coronado, so right. I had a heart attack. And, you know, uh, you have to shut all the windows uh, you have to drop all the, oh, the water out of the bait tanks. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that you have to do, you know. And, and it was after they had the big, you know, the big, uh, what were they, the bells that had the big, they went to the smaller uh, oh, choppers. Oh, the type of helicopter, right. And so I remember I was one of my passengers, Herb Clemenson, he was a charter master that actually had the heart attack. And we're fortunate in that he, was, he ended up being okay, and they ran him straight to Scripps, and we were just down right. by the Coronados. But, you know... 
It, what an interesting thing, you, you know, letting the basket, you can't touch it because it's charged static. up so much with static electricity or knock you, knock you on your behind, you know. And, uh, but so the whole procedure in doing all that was really interesting. Like, and again, one of the blessings was he ended up being fine, but... You know, um, yeah, all kinds of emergencies. Yeah. But, yeah, we're geared up for it, and we've dealt with it. So, yeah. All right, Steve Bermudez. I'm not exactly sure. I think Steve's in the tequila again. <laughs> what would you say that the sport fishing industry is heavily regulated by the state and the feds plus local edge? Maybe what do you say about that? How do you feel about that, Steve? Uh, take another shot and rephrase that. But is that you think that's what it is? Yeah, I mean, nowadays you have to have all your MLPA areas mapped out so you can stay out of it and fish right up to the lines, and that's all the state level. Um, feds, when you deal with Coast Guard, you got to make sure all your Coast Guard regs are met, crewy-wise, and, geez, you know, it's... Local all, agencies, all everything? yeah. Um, it's a big pain in the neck, I guess, right? Yeah, paperwork, state, fish logs, <laughs> you name it. It's, it's all got to be taken it's care of. It's changed quite a bit, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I never had to. I mean, it would drive me crazy dealing with that. I th I'm, thank God you guys do it. Yeah, because, because I can't, yeah. part of being an outdoors guy, a guy that wants to be a fisherman and everything, those are not the kind of guys, at least I, I wasn't, that want to be to heavily with... involved in paperwork. Oh, absolutely right? not. It was so about, it's like yeah. you're trying to put somebody who's not, right? I mean, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Radio logs for FCC. <laughs> yeah. Coast I mean, you know, you're tied up yeah. in paperwork. You know, it wasn't tied up in paper. I wanted to put my time, invest my time in catching fish, you know, and that was the whole deal. I mean, that's how all of us, you know, he, you get your reputations by what you catch, you know, and, and, and the service that you're giving them. And so that's where our focus was back in those days. And now, you know, they they tie the poor crews up and the, you know, the boats up with so much of this political stuff. It's like anything, folks. Hate to say it, but, you know, I, I don't know anything good that's coming out of politics, you know. <laughs> but it does. It, it really takes away from... You know, what we're there for, the main part, having fun, catching fish, you know. But it's something we're dealing with now, days, you know, on all levels. All right, all right. Angler Pliers. Uh, that is David Rosenthal says he knew a deckhand who got back from a five-day trip and had to go to L.A. when they found him asleep in his car in the middle of an off-ramp. These guys worked their tails off. Very little sleep. That didn't surprise me, man. I've been so dead tired. And Steve and Danny, I know you guys have too. It's brutal. Oh, yeah. You're not off standing up. I mean, yeah. it, it happens. Anybody that's ever driven a boat at night knows it's, it, it, you, you, there's nodding times. <laughs> but uh, it's an important role. Everybody, Every boat has to have somebody awake. And that really... Uh, Showed up after that last accident they had up the coast. They didn't have anybody awake, and it, it was a disaster. Talking about the conception. Yeah. You know, that that was so sad. I mean, we were so First strict. Thing, yeah. We were so strict about that. It, it was, uh, you know, it's funny because, Phil, that I was sitting there at my counter at my house watching TV in the kitchen, and I saw it in one, one of the first scenes that flipped to the, the bow of the boat tied to a mooring buoy. And immediately, and my brother could tell you this, I'm t I said, they were all asleep. You know, you're tied off to the morning. We anchor, so we're checking our coordinates. We're walking the deck. Make sure you're not you know, dragging anchor. We're not right. dragging anchor. And so, uh, you know, from two minutes into seeing that that morning, I called the shot, and it was exactly what it was. They were all asleep. And then later on, as you find out, the other crew members were, they were all okay. They got hurt from jumping down the deck because guess what? They're up in the wheelhouse, you know. But, you know, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. And the bad part is our entire industry suffers because of that, Become, you know, because of that. And they start, they're going to implement more and more regulations and rules because of their negligence. So I, I, I'm, I'm upset. 
I'm really ticked off at these idiots that felt that it was okay to go to sleep on the anchor, you know. And uh, of course, and we grew up differently, you know. But you're dealing with a lot of people's lives. You, you can't take any chances with that, you know. And that's why that, that uh, you know, it really kicks, you know, it, it ticks me off so much because people don't understand. And one time, like, when we were around, I, you know, I don't know if it's still like that today, but there were two groups. Uh, Lloyds of London and Tokyo Marine were the only two people that insured the entire boating industry. Right. So when something like that happens, guess what? All everybody of our, gets, everybody gets hit with, you know, with premiums because of negligence. So I don't have any sympathy for these guys that, that got hauled off the jail. They should have. There's negligence, you know, and they cost lives. Unexcusable. So, you know, of course, like I said, we grew up old school, you know, but that's the way it should be. All right, Dave Clark says, uh, skippers are close to a medic. I've had several hooks run through a finger, <laughs> and the skipper had it out in no time. It's like magic. Those guys that know what they're doing know how to yeah. do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've had to s snap a few hooks out of people's hands and fingers. and If done right, it, it, it's out before they know it. But uh, if it's a big hook, you have to be careful. Um, we had an incident last year where we had a and actually end up pushing the hook all the way through and cutting the hook apart and pulling the two pulling it through. But uh, I've heard stories of where if the hook's big enough, you got to watch, make sure you don't start cutting through um, veins and artery yeah, type yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah. Out. That's all. I yes. Know. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, just just little hooks. You know, I mean, yeah. the trick would be you, you get the, the monofilament, you hold it back, you hold the tip down so it comes straight back out, right? And you would say, okay, I'm going to count to three. And you go, one, two, but you pull on two. You pull it on two, so they're waiting for the three, and it's already out. So, it, yeah, you know, it works. we've done a few of those. <laughs> All right, Rob S. says, you don't touch a skid or the basket on a chopper, static electricity. He says, California wants to kill sport fishing. Any comment? Well, yeah, you sure know, they, seems like yeah. licensing wise, it's getting very convoluted. Uh, rock fishing regulations, uh, different species, different number of limits for different types of fish. Uh, you almost have to be a biologist to figure out which ones they're talking about sometimes. You know, if they're not out there all the time, you can't expect the average fisherman to be able to identify every fish that they're catching. So I don't. They I don't need give to simplify a, some of that stuff. Yeah, and then I don't give a lot of credence to the biologists. You know, they're not out there all the time. They don't fish. They don't. You know, there's there's right. different things that they do more on theory, and you know, it makes no sense. I mean, no, well, they have you, been. They they're starting to relax some of the rock cod fishing regulations at least. Well, thank and, God. And but it's still not blanketed and making it easy for. The, the season, uh, the depth restrictions, areas. And, you know, we still have a lot of cow cod closure areas that are completely off limits, but they're trying to open things up. It's just really tough. Well, you know, you guys, I think, were the only ones, only boats that had a decompression chamber, right? For, well, for yeah, the for the cod. scientists that yeah, we've taken right? out, we've had so they can decompress a, a cow cod and put it back down and send the tracking unit on it, wasn't it? Something like well, that. Well, uh, that and then the ones that we've kept alive, we've used the decompression chambers. The ones that we release back into the wild, we use the uh, depth release type devices, descending devices to release the fish, and they've survived. They've done really well. But, uh, you know, I don't know if everybody uses those descending devices, but they work. We keep a lot of fish alive that way. Yeah, release amazing. them. All right, I got a question for both of you. Yeah. Guys. For me, Steve, will sport fishing landings, like 22nd Street Landing, be here in 20 years? According to city charters, I think they're required to have they're required, but I mean, will yeah. they put so much restrictions and will they put so many 
fees that it makes them impossible to operate. They 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 could say to them, yeah, I would, go ahead and operate. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think it'll completely eliminate all the boats. Um, what's probably going to happen? You're kind of going to see it too. Nobody's built any new boats in the last ten years or so. Very few, at least. And so the actual number of boats is going down just to attrition. Boats are getting too old, out of commission. Um, and the, the result of that is supply and demand. The price of the trips are going to start going up higher and higher, not only just to survive, but that's the way the market works. If there's not many boats running, they, gotta char they, can, they can charge more. And people want to get out. But, uh, yeah, the, the sport fishing boats are becoming farther and fewer between. Danny, yeah. what do you think? Oh, yeah. No, I, I worry about that. I worry about that, too. You know, but, you know, we thought that we saw, we, we've seen the ceilings on some of the pricing. But as we're seeing, you know, people just love the fish and they're willing to pay the price. Um, it's not that we're, it's... It's, and I'm not saying it's what the market's going to bear. It's not that. Because you know, you consumers know as well as I, all of us, the price of fuel, and particularly recently, the last couple of years, was artificially set because we had a failure to pump our own fuel in areas that we have the, the greatest amount of, you know, of natural resources to do that. And we were paying ridiculous prices unnecessarily because of politics. And so hopefully we can get back to that, you know, when we get our common sense politic people back in, uh, we won't have to deal with it. Maybe it'll make it a little more affordable as far as that goes. But, you know, starting from fuel, that's a big, that's one of the biggest hits. All right, Rob L. says he could do uh, that night watch thing because he doesn't sleep. He worked graveyards for decades. <laughs> Dave Clark, it's very comforting as a passenger to know that at least one, if not two, crew guys are awake. That's for sure, man. Right. If everybody's asleep. <clears> bigger boats not, all, that's right? That's cool. Yeah, a hundred percent. Cue ball made reference to the conception, which we talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Isaac says, good evening, gentlemen, and sends a $50 bill over. Totally. Wow. Right. Isaac, Thank you, you have no... Give you a hug on Saturday at our surf fishing uh, big seminar down on the beach. Um, Isaac says, what are your thoughts, both you guys, taking one by one, on this early fishing going on? What do you think? We kind of talked about it, but let's do it again. You know, it's just going to get better and better, Phil. I mean, you've been down there in Ensenada. You saw the, uh, the yellowtail. But, I mean, the bluefin, I don't think they've ever gone anywhere. I, no. I'm pretty sure that, you know. They're feeding on whatever they yeah. And, you know, if you get squid Bunner. out of Cortez and, and they're down deep, people, they do not need to surface. They can sit down there and gorge on that stuff all winter long, you know, right. until they have to come up and search for a fin bait or whatever else. But, uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't think any of these fish are going anywhere for a while. And there's, you know, there's, from what I gather, it sounds like there's a, a volume of yellowtail on their way up, too. That would be the best. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a win-win nice deal, you know? Yeah. I uh, I talked to one pongaro in Mexico today at five yellowtail. Not yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah. All nice gray, too. All beautiful mm -hmm. gray. And blackfin sport fishing caught their first bluefin. They're on Punta Banda there in Ensenada. First bluefin on a ponga. It may be this year in Ensenada. So there's another step in the wow. right direction. Wow, wow. Yeah, wow. Um, and uh, Rob S. says, he, a political endorsement, Trump 2024. <laughs> We're not allowed to talk politics. <laughs> yeah. I do. <laughs> Trump 2024. I'm, yeah. reading, uh, I'm just reading comments here, everybody. We have no censorship here, unless it's vulgar or something like that. But you're free to express. Well, it. you know, here, right. here we go. And, you know, in this industry, too, I mean, like we just talked about it, you know, how many of you guys remember a few years ago when it changed over, our fuel started jumping through the roof? Well, that is a cost push deal to the boats and everybody involved in the industry, right? Why would we shut off our own supply, which we have the largest supply of fuel that we're sitting on, and import it? 
and pay foreign countries for fuel. That's pretty stupid. Pretty stupid when we have the fuel right underneath us. And notice that it's election time and your cost of gas is going down. What do you think about that? So when you go out to vote, think about if you love fishing, if, if you love paying less money for your own gas tank, there's probably only one way to vote, folks. You know, so I'm telling you that, you know, it's, uh, it's, to me, it's, it's not so much politics, it's common sense. Look at Steve staying out of this, aren't you, Steve? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, you know what? The sad part of this whole thing is, to me, that in the old days, Danny could say just that, and I could be a big Biden guy, right? Not saying what I right. am, and I'd say, hey, you're wrong, here's my idea, hey, let's go get some dinner. But now... Everybody's going to hate you, and it's so oh, ridiculous. Yeah. Right. People right. have different opinions. Oh, absolutely. Big deal. Yeah, absolutely. everybody's got an opinion. But, yeah, everybody's got that and something else, too. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to our questions. Alberto Ponce says, hey, Phil, was it Nacho, the captain, who caught that bluefin? I don't know who was running the boat out of Blackfin, but probably was Nacho. He's a really exceptional fisherman. I fish him. Isaac wanted to know your thoughts on the fishing we're seeing, and then he further wants to know, is this a La Nina or an El Nino, or what's going on? So I know that we're currently under the influence of kind of a mild El Nino. They think it'll trans go into a La Nina late summer. What do you guys think? Who knows? It seems like a mix yeah, of everything. Bring it on if it's a change. As long as we have fish within range, we're going to go after them. Steve, are we going to catch any albacore this year? I certainly hope so, but I can't make that prediction. It's just um, the last couple of years we've been in cold water. We went all the way up to the Northern California, Oregon border on a research trip, and we were real close to the coast, and we didn't see any albacore that close, but we heard of some of the boats running into them just offshore a little ways, but... I don't think we've had any albacore very close to Southern California. I mean, well, we a did. Few were, yeah, there's a handful, a handful of them, handful of them caught here and there, point. but not in any great big numbers yet. All right, hoping. folks, we apologize for the dog fight going on. If you can do a, a, a podcast with all this going on, you guys are pros. That's <laughs> it. And then that's part of the show. Later, it's coming yeah. in in a little while. We'll, we'll bring them in. Or? Believe it or not. <laughs> Maybe a little bit later, we'll bring the dogs in here so they can uh, chew on. Danny and Steve's foot for a little while. There you go. All right, uh, let's see. Um, tired of fuel surcharges, Rob S. says. And I know what he's talking about. I know that you have to do it, but it's just like another, you've already paid all this money, right. and now here's another one. I bet you guys feel bad asking for it. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's all a matter of what the price of fuel and um, what the boat has extrapolate as far as the price of fuel next summer and if it goes well beyond that the fuel surcharges a lot of times they don't even make up the difference of the price change but it just lessens the hurt of the the fuel bill um i could see both sides i, I could see you know you pay for a trip and then you have to pay extra to for fuel surcharge it, it hurts um but we don't control the price of fuel. <laughs> All right, uh, let's get further into the politics, just for Danny. Uh, Isaac, who's a great guy, great family guy. Danny, I'm a Marine veteran. Thank you for your service. Uh, Isaac, Absolutely. you are spot Absolutely. on. I think he's talking about Well, Trump. you know what? Well, our family, I mean, we look back at, you know, from my, our, my dad did two tours in the Korean War in the Air Force, the older brothers. Three of them went to Europe, and uh, you guys, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the 442nd. They, you know, they're in the 442nd, and then we had one that was in the MIS that actually, Uncle Dick went intelligence out Intelligence service, yeah, right? Yeah, military intelligence service went out in the Pacific, which was highly dangerous, and they're flying around in the hollowed out B-24s over the Philippines with extended range fuel bladders in the, in the B-24s to intercept messages. It was a military intelligence service, so... We're heavily loaded with uh, you know, Patriots. Vet, Patriot <laughs> veterans. I was uh, ready to go to Vietnam, and had my number been called, I, you know, 
it was funny because guys go, hey, we'll go up to Canada, we'll go fishing. I says, you know what? If I ran up to Canada, my dad, and my uncles would come and, and get me, and I would take a worse beating than going to Vietnam. So it, it was that I would I would have gone. Yeah, but thank you for your service. It All right, Jonathan Jones says sport fishing brings millions to the state every year. Never going to stop me from fishing. That's the main reason I would never leave. SoCal, I'm a Biden guy, and I still love you, Danny. That's the kind of guy I'm talking about. All right, about. there we Good go. Good stuff, John. We will still fish together. I love it. Yeah. That's okay. perfect. America. Biden guy, can you vote this time for Trump, though? <laughs> okay, all right, I'll let you go. I'll let you go. We're all Americans, right? Yeah. That's yeah, the comment. That's about. it. That's how it used to be, too. We, we all got along. All right, Q-Ball says what Danny said. Dave, Dave Clark, agree with Steve's earlier Mention life would be great if a large mass of yellowtail showed up soon. And I saw Steve shaking his head saying, yeah, that would be cool, right? Yeah, it's always nice to have variety throughout the season. Um, the guys on the boats, I think they, they kind of get trapped in a Groundhog Day situation. If you keep going out every single day catching the same fish over and over and over, they kind of lose interest. And uh, having a different variety of fish really makes it a lot more interesting. All right, yeah. Steve Bermudez takes exception to me saying that he was drinking tequila. He said that his comment was very clear. All right, sorry, <laughs> Steve. I still don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Dave Clark, Steve, how was the price of bait? How has it changed over the past couple of years? Maybe it's, I, I can't read, <laughs> Steve. Maybe that's the problem. Go uh, ahead. For the boats, it's the same. It's 15% for most of the boats that run out of San Diego, and I imagine up here, um, uh, the ones that deal with Irvingham Bait Company, um, it's 15% of the, their charter price. So in terms of change, is when the boats increase their charter price, they increase their percentage of what they take. <laughs> So that's how the sport fishing boats, I, uh, the private boats that go up, I, the price of bait has gone sky high. Has it? What is it now? Like 100 bucks a scoop or something? Between 50 and 100 bucks. Oh I think, my God. Uh, for prime bait, yeah, they, they get a. <laughs> wow. That is a wow. But, I, but yeah. Yeah, it's. I've a, been out of it for a, long, they, a lot of years. They control the live bait. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Well, and you got to have it, folks. Face it, that's what separates our fishery here in Southern California from any fishery in the world. I mean, yeah. bar none, folks. We are very blessed having it because you, you, you travel around the, the country and to have this compared to what I've seen everywhere else I've fished in the country and some places in the world, it's not even, it's not even comparable. It's such yeah. a, you know... Tremendous. You can make your own bait. That's yeah. not the only way you get yeah. fish live bait. Yeah. So we're spoiled. We're spoiled. It's you know phenomenal. So we're blessed. Rob S says, Hoorah, Danny. I think the Marine call, right? Yeah. Exactly. Semper Fi. All right. Jonathan Jones says, We all want a better tomorrow. I am an American first before any other labels. You gotta respect this guy. I love you, Jonathan. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Good all right, go ahead. Anything else with your bro, or do you want to bring Nancy we'll bring, in? Or we can what, bring Nancy in with him as well. Yeah, bring her in. yeah, we'll bring yeah. You sure? Yeah. Steve, and, good yeah. job. I, <laughs> I'm going to segue my sister. While she was in college, she was at UCSB, you know, during the summer times. I'd bring her, we bring her down to give her my van, and she would do the shopping for the Fortune, the Cherokee Geisha, and the, and the Mustang for us, you know. And... Um, Daily, she'd come up and she'd have to go to Islandia to drop stuff off for us and H&M Landing to drop stuff off. And when the end of the season came and Nancy went back to UCSB and I did the shopping, I started thinking about it and said, guess what, you know, I, I don't think I paid her enough. That was a lot of work. And I go, holy smokes. Go so bank, anyway, yeah, yeah, my uh, baby sister took care of all that for us. And now, segueing in from... Finding Ludwig, one of our favorite dogs and our family dogs, they recently had a thing. Steve, tell, you, you tell me about it, or Nancy oh, could tell yeah, us. Nancy could tell you. Yeah. Basically, on Valentine's Day, um, we found two dogs wandering around in our neighborhood, and we 
rather than let them run through the streets, we put a leash on them, brought them in alongside the house in hopes of getting them uh, reconnected with their owners. And uh, later went by, found out they were chipped. We got in touch with the original owners and they had moved out and weren't able to retain their dogs. So they found a home for it, for the two. And uh, they texted the people with the phone number, of my sister, in hopes of reconnecting the people with, with the owner, the previous owners. And as it was, the, the people abandoned their dog. And bottom line is we still have them after three, four weeks. And we're just looking for the right home for them. All right, so let's uh, we'll have you come out, Steve, and yeah, we're gonna do a swap a room. Yeah, yeah, Nancy's yeah. gonna so come in. Watch yeah. the dogs. All right. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll take that mic off you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good dogs, job, Steve. Dogs right. have been. And then dogs I'll have been get Nancy a... in here. All right. While she's coming yeah. in, I'll remind you all I'll be at Bass Pro Shops on Sunday. Oh, that's right. At twelve noon. That's gonna be a lot of fun, Danny. Is this the new one? Uh, this is no, the, I think I'm going to be there too. They okay, asked me, I'm trying to look at my I calendar yeah, on that one. Go check that one out. Yeah. So we'll be doing that and, uh, we'll, uh, be keeping you all in touch with the latest. Uh, I'm losing my track of uh, thought now with these dogs all over the place. Um, also, um, I wanted to bring you up on the fishing, tremendous bluefin tuna fishing going on out of San Diego, down the Baja coast. Danny, you know how good it's been. We had the Polaris Supreme last night, 43 fish, 50 to 180 pounds. Sounds like the Pacific Dawn has 10 or a dozen, over 100 pounds. Uh, the Tribute last week had a yellowfin tuna and very good bluefin tuna fishing. So it really has been fantastic. That's all right. I think we're, we're pretty used to it by now. All right. Is he going to bite me if I put a microphone on you? Absolutely not. Okay, good. <laughs> Here we go. All right, it's all your turn, Nancy. Ah. <laughs> well, you want me to read hi. a couple of questions before, and then we can, uh, we'll catch up with some questions, and I'll let sure. you take over. Well, yeah, right. oh, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. All right, uh, let's see, we've got Doug Tilk. Give those dogs some Costco <laughs> chicken. Uh, Jonathan Jones, hit that like button. Phil, what's your birthday wish this year? Hey, Jonathan, uh, how about just that I'm so grateful for people like you and all the family that we've managed to accumulate here. Danny, your sister, this Freeman Adventure family is a real deal. I am so grateful for your great support. Uh, I really am blessed, and if I can just keep all my friends and family good, I'll be very happy. I'm going to cry here. Okay. <laughs> Steve Bermudez. Uh oh is he back in the tequila? Uh, Steve says, uh, Steve, after all these years of using diesel, do you think it's gotten better or worse? in its blend, when does the price of diesel fluctuate with the seasons? Danny? Well, no, that one, that one Steve would know because I haven't used diesel since I ran boats. I all mean, right, I, we'll yeah, get Steve we, yeah, we'll get Steve. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get him to answer that. Steve, Whether the quality is better. Okay, yeah. And then Isaac retracted a message. We'll be back with Isaac in a moment. Go ahead, introduce your sister. Okay, well, this is my sister, Nancy. <laughs> and... Um, in all those years, uh, you know, that we ran the boats out of H&M and... and uh, Islandia. Islandia. I had her doing all the shopping for the three boats, the Fort Cherokee Bay. Geisha, the Fortune, <laughs> and the Mustang. And until the, she went to school in the fall, in September, and then I would go out and do the shopping. Of course, we had less trips. It wasn't every day, like, you know, during the summer. She was just, you know, making the run every day because we're all... All three boats were running every day throughout the summer. Yep. But uh, I realized that uh, probably didn't pay her enough because it was a lot of work. But um, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that's what got us through the summer is her supplying all the boats that I landed in and H and M, you know, and all our boats with uh, supplies. And that's a lot of work, I got to tell you. So that's part of an operation that a lot of the the fishermen don't really see. You know, there's a lot more to it than just uh, Turning the wrenches, changing oil, loading bait, gaffing fish. You know, there's these the backside of the operation that takes a lot of time and effort and everything to keep everything running too. So that's a big part of it. What about that, Nancy? How was that? Man, I think Costco. It was 
Price Club. It was Price right? Club. Yeah, it was before it was Costco. Yeah, before it was Costco. We go, I go over there and have two, three flats, and people would ask me, "My gosh, you have a big family?" And <laughs> little did they know, I was shopping for three boats: oh, leech, wow. soda, beer, everything. Things from one-day trips to three-day trips, and uh, going to the butcher shop and all that good stuff. So. Yeah, it was busy times, but it was day in, day out. They would call in um, the ETA along with a list of what I needed to I bring. Remember, they used to oh, bring it on man. the radio, right? Yeah. Eggs, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That was me. And I'd load up the van and take it down to the landing. The guys would meet us, meet me down there and, whoa, she wants to join the Huskies. <laughs> oh, gosh. So, uh, but yeah, they were good old days. Really good. I would make deposits for your boats. Oh yeah. At the bank. And, yeah. Well, we never got uh, off the boat. Most of us never got off the boat. No. Yeah. They, if there was a, a part to be picked up at Harbor that's Freight, right. I was driving that back down back up here to pick it up. From Harold. Yeah. Yep. From yeah. Harold and. Uh, yeah, we had. You know, it was a nucleus it. of a lot yeah. of good friends, Phil. Uh, that helped us survive the, the Frank Fred Lewis, the Harold Wettis from Harbor Stop. Diesel, George Yoshiokas from the diesel fuel system. I mean, and, and just friends, a lot of friends that helped yeah. out, you know. Um, we could have done it without them. Absolutely could not have done that without them. So, you know, very blessed. And, you know, over the years through these lifelong relationships, similar to the ones that all you guys that go fish, I mean, it's priceless. It's priceless having you guys as friends, you know, and and uh, the stories, you know, and the history that we have together is just, you know, unbelievable. So, yeah. I'll yeah. read another one. Yeah, uh, Isaac wants to know, Danny, did you see the legend testing rods? They were high sticking that seeker they tested, withstood ninety pounds at a twenty to fifty pound rod, but just goes to prove what you've been saying: don't high stick. You know. I gotta tell you something. I, I watch these guys, and, and if you're really a sharp guy, you'll understand. You'll you'll figure out the technical part of it. You know that when you're high stick and you drop off in pressure, but as you drop off in pressure, you increase the risk of blowing that rod up. You know, and it just makes no sense. I watch guys doing that all the time, and so when you watch captains and most of the crew members that know what they're doing, right? Where are they doing it? They're pointing the rod almost straight down. So generally, uh, as you're, if you do point the rod straight down at the fish, you're getting 100% of lift, but you're not getting, you're not getting much cushion at all. You know, there's and there's no elongation in the rod. It's just straight pointed at it. So it's strictly the line that you're pulling, but you're getting the most pressure at that point. Do you need a flex, a little flex? Yeah, I like to keep a little flex in it. So I have it angled down at least 45, you know, to give a little cushion there. But it's it's not just that, it's the timing. It's it's bringing in, and, and a lot of fishermen, and I'm not talking about you guys that know what you're doing, the astute guys. The astute guys who are all watching, you're watching the swell, because you're timing it with the swell, you know. And as the boat goes up, you're holding. As it goes down, you're stroking. So, you know, as you're, as you're pulling with that, that motion, that, that cadence, you know, that fish is coming up like this, okay? If you watch a guy that lifts and drops his rod and drips, that fish gets his, it's doing this. And when they get their head down and they kick, where are they going? They're taking drag on you, you know? So the idea is to keep it planing with the head up. So it's constant keeping, constant pressure on it all the time. And to keep that amount of pressure, you have to keep that low angle. If you get it up here where you got one-tenth the pressure, that, that fish is it's so much easier for them to get their head down on you. So, you know, it's, it's understanding that. And it's, it's not luck that you put the fish on quicker and you're catching more fish. It's implementing the right technique. All right, David Alcantar. Danny, I went fishing at Lake Skinner, and I got skunk, drop shot, jerk bait, swim baits. Those little green fish can be a pain in the you-know-what. I've had plenty of those. <laughs> Don't feel like the Lone Ranger, you know, but that's fishing. And particularly, you know, bass are bass, you know. But typically this time of year, you know, 
was the time of year I used to fish, you know, from December to March is when those those fish hit their peak. The the big, uh, well, we the, it was the first cross between the Floridas and the Northerns. That particular strain, um, you know, peaked usually, I, I think by March was about the last time you started seeing some of the big fish, you know. After that, they were all spawned out. So when we're chasing those real trophies, uh, you know, December through March was the, the prime time. And I dropped, uh, you know, fortunately, we, we didn't run like we did during the summer, summertime. I wouldn't have been able to fish at all. So, and going during the week and running the charters on the Mustang on the weekend was perfect, you know, because during the week, you don't have the traffic up at the lake. And, and just like anything else, those fish are very, they're, they're sensitive to the pressure on the lakes. The less pressure on the lakes, the more spots you can hit without spooking fish. So I think that has a lot to do with it, too. Yeah. All right, Steve Bermudez is back, and he says, Hello, Nancy. Did you ever get mad at your brother and not show up at the <laughs> landing? What a good question. I like that. I never got mad at my brother, but I remember when Steve and Danny were working on the same boat. They are on the Mustang, and... Uh, they were fighting, and I was in tears, calling mom and dad. They're fighting. <laughs> it was horrible. So yeah, boys but I, boys. <laughs> yeah, but I, I never, I never ditched him. <laughs> no, and I, you know, over the years, he, he's the steady guy. I'm the hothead. You really? Know. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 <clears throat> I, you know, that's what made it nice for me to play football. I could let it all out. You know? <laughs> You certainly mellowed out in your later years. Oh, I had, a, I had no <laughs> choice. You, you keep it in and don't blow up here. No, 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 I did No, only, only when I sit down and watch political. <laughs> Phil, it's only when I see political things now. Oh. <laughs> then I'll still blow. <laughs> yeah. I love uh. it. Anything else? Go ahead. Uh, Nancy, did you enjoy doing that? It sounds like oh. a very rigorous lifestyle. No, it was just for those few busy months, but it was good. Great. I had the best mentor in the world. I had Ruby Mio, uh, George Mio's wife at the time. Um, at that time, she mentored me, showed me the ropes, how to do all this. Yeah. Um, they had the new hustler too, and yeah. you know she had the one boat. I had the three, so I just bought more food than she did and supplies. But well, and then was um, it the uh, didn't, uh, Jenny? Was it Whitey Ashley's Whitey Ashley? The, you know the Aztec Pacificas and. You know, did was, she just shop with those? Guys? No, it was oh, yeah. yeah, strictly yeah, Ruby. Ruby. She was yeah, my yeah. she was my buddy. Called yeah. her Wooby, and uh, we just had the best best summer ever. So, but yeah, it was just it was great fun. Yeah. During the day, I'd shop, and uh, at night, just <laughs> be crazy, load the van up, and go to sometimes two different landings at Islandia or H and M, and drop off the supplies and. I think by midnight, I think I, I would have dinner and go back and relax, ready for the next day. It's so funny, <laughs> Nancy, yeah. because I haven't thought about that galley thing coming over the VHF radio uh, probably for 30 years. And so yeah. you just mentioned it, and then I go, oh, yeah. That's a big, <laughs> part, that. big, big part of Oranges, it. Oranges, yep. you know, two cases, uh, you know, exactly. milk. Uh, oh. 10 gallons or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> 10 cases of beer and, you yeah. know, soda, bleach, Yeah, and, everything. and you know, we had no days off. I yeah. mean, we ran for three months solid and then some sometimes. Oh, you know. I know. I was doing the pillowcases for the boats and all the guys' clothes. I'd have baskets with their names on it and I'd have it folded and ready for oh, them. Oh, yeah, to, that's true. Wow. You remember? Yeah, you guys would come in. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you know, she dealt with, yeah. you know, the Brian Kiyoharas, the Harlan Burr. Oh, yeah. You know, the Tanaka brothers, you know, <laughs> all these kids that became captains, you know. So we, we were very blessed having them on board with us. Oh, too. yeah. You know? Yeah, and, but what a yeah. job. Yeah. I mean, no. That's a heck of a job, isn't it? It was. It had to be organized. Had, yeah, 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 three and one summer I helped out a couple other boats too, but because those guys sometimes <laughs> they're in there for like forty-five minutes an hour, right? So you gotta uh, make this all happen. Yeah, by the time on a turn and burn kind of thing. I would, yeah, definitely Your meet. Wife's behind the dogs. Oh, there yeah, we go. Okay. Yeah, I would definitely, go. yeah, get there when they would get in, so the guys could, you know, help me take the stuff down there. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Crazy, man. Unbelievable. Good days, though. Unbelievable. They were yeah. great. Go ahead. Anything else? Did, no, did you no. have a couple of dogs you were going to introduce? Yes, or, I think. Should we take the camera? What do you think would be better yes. to take the camera outside to show you the, the you two puppies yeah, up for probably. a dog? Did, did hey, you show them this? She has... Before we go, uh, Nancy, why don't you talk about this food you brought down here? Because oh, oh my god, we should, we should show that, right? Of oh course. my god, we had a right buddy. here, right? Yeah. We have furikake chicken, yeah, with rice and the potato, the mac salad. Yes. Over here we have the teriyaki beef with oh. fried rice. Yum. And over here, this is chicken katsu yes. with the white rice and. Some of that tonkatsu sauce. Oh, this is a ro Hawaiian roast pork. Oh, that is so good. Uh, that was pretty good. Oh, and we can't forget the moose, bam musubis. Yeah, yeah, that looks good. So, um, Auntie Miley's. We just stopped by there on the way home. Auntie Miley's in Torrent. In you know, Torrance, on Normandy. These babies were basically the perfect boat food for mm -hmm. all the years. And, and guys, you know, right. all we call them yeah, the what? round dice, you guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> They go, what is that? I said, well, you know, this is, a, this is, a, no this is a Buddha head <laughs> sandwich, man. <laughs> Roll it up in cellophane, keep it in your pocket, okay. pull it on, you gnaw on it, you know. But, I mean, this is what got us through many of those years, you know, in the old days, you know, when we had uh, uh, the bento boxes in the galleys, you know. And if we didn't have a galley, we did, you know, all these guys would bring all the all that food, all the bento boxes and stuff loaded with uh all the old traditional things. Yeah. So, yeah. Right, and then you had an information sheet there. Did you want to oh, show that, Nancy? Or is yeah. that important? This is important. So we're seeking a loving forever home for Grayson and Selena. They're five years old. Their siblings born on May third. They're gonna be six years old on May third. They're both fixed and microchipped. They're friendly, sweet, and well socialized with people and other dogs. Um, we just need them to find a loving home to be adopted together, for and sure. They've never been apart. We're going to go meet them now? We're going to go meet them. And they've been, here's a microchip number, and um, they're, they're just great dogs that just can't handle three Huskies and a Yorkie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go do that. So, you guys, right. if you I'll can you get them. Go ahead, yeah, let's, let's go. go. I'll just go. There yeah, you go. Ahead. Yeah. This way, she's I'm dying to I'm see him. I'm sure to fall down and trip. Oh, if be I careful! Do, Nancy, make sure you get video. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll All catch right. you. Hey, we need to come out here and see the land. All right. Ah, oh, wow! Here. There they are. All right, let's go check it out. Happy All right, day. go, go for it. All right, here we go. Hey, this oh, look at here. these guys. <laughs> hey, these guys. Hey, Bailey. How's my bay? Huh? So this is Grayson with one. Blue eye and one uh, brown eye, and this is Selena with two blue eyes, and they're thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> and do they call you? Is that what they do? If they want to adopt? Um, yes. Or can there? we? You gave them your number, yeah? Yeah, but here you you've got the uh, the information on that sheet, right? Yeah, but to contact. There's no phone number. Oh no. There. Oh yeah, okay. There's no phone oh, number. Oh no. Well, they have. The, you want to contact you, right? Sure. Yeah. What's yeah. the number? So uh, if, if you're interested, please give them a loving home. That's all we want. Oh, that's all we want is a loving home for them. And that would be, uh, give me a call at 714-328-8901. Do that. Okay, and I'll do it one more time. Yeah. Area code 714-328-8901. Okay, so give me, give us a call. We're dying to find a loving home for them. All right, anything else, Danny? No, I think that's it, Phil. Thank you, everybody, and uh, well, beautiful evening here down at 22nd Street. Jeff, Thank what's up? We're live, Jeff. Say hi to everybody. What's up? <laughs> hey, Davinus, do you ever stop working? No. <laughs> it's the nature of this business. So we can hear them it's the mind. nature of this business. Never quit working and never quit dealing with the bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys doing? Show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 We're live. <laughs> See you later, Jeff. <coughs> Thank Tony in the office there, Phil. Yep. Thanks, Tony. Hey, That's bud. Good. Appreciate the effort to work. The manager. We're, yeah, we're, we're, still we're live right now. We're live, but uh, the manager fishing off. Stick yeah. your head out. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. All right. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Why don't you wrap this up with your sister? Get all together all right. there. Uh, Ness, come on in. And uh, you can wrap up the show so, right yeah. now. Come here. Here we go, folks. Come here. Come Thank you guys come for here. tuning in. We appreciate that, and we hope we can get these dogs adopted yeah. to a loving family. I mean, that's a big part of our family, too, is we've been around dogs. and we're, terrible. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So thank you for tuning in, folks. Thank we'll see you, you next week. Give me a call. <laughs> Good girl. <coughs> I got these dogs. Okay. Go ahead and let go of them. Oh, wait.